So Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing is one of those hymns that I think nearly everyone here has probably heard at some point in their life. Um, it crosses almost all denominations, and it speaks truth. Our every blessing does come from our Lord and Father. And like many hymns, there are multiple verses that are written, but only so many of those make it into the hymnal. Some of those lyrics get pulled for contemporary choruses that you're starting to hear come out. One of the contemporary choruses for Come Thou Fount reads like this. How your kindness yet pursues me, how your mercy never fails me. Till the day that death shall loose me, I will sing, oh, I will sing. We invite you to stand and sing with us this morning. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it. Mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be, that thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy course above. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy course above. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. All right, just a few announcements this morning. I'm John Shear, if anybody has met me, but I'm... Uh, we're going to have an annual meeting next weekend, next Sunday, between services, so we're going to try to get that going right away at 10 o'clock, because we're trying to get the service started back at 10.30, so fairly quick usually, um, but uh, definitely show up, please. I think they'll be voting on new people and new offices and trying to get all that all worked out, so, um, so bring any questions you have, but there'll be lots of information next weekend. Glenn, is there going to be anything on the website prior to the... Thank you. And then Amy from uh, their Safe Families for Children is going to be here next. She's going to be uh, speaking at both services. So I don't personally know Amy. Uh, her bio is pretty awesome. Uh, she has a ton of energy and passion for Safe Families, and it's, it's going to be kind of that focus. And we are a partner church, uh, Lake Union Covenant Church, so we are going to be supporting that project and so she is going to be here to kind of give an overview of that kind of I'm sure talk about what they do the successes I'm sure some of the hardships so um, that will be between services so both at 9 and 10 30 next weekend so I think that's the major announcements mm -hmm. so we will have a prayer by Pastor Steve hey let's join in prayer as we continue with worship this morning Lord, it is so good to be in your house. It's so good to be with others who know and love you or people who may be struggling and are here 
for the first time, Lord. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would come upon us now, Lord, that you would awaken our minds and our hearts, that you would fill our voices with praise, Lord, that our attention would be on you and on you solely, Lord, with so many things going on in our world and in our lives, Lord, we say again that we belong to you. We offer ourselves up to you as your children, as worshipers, as we look forward to that day when we will all be gathered around the throne with people from every tribe, nation, tongue, and language. Lord, as we acknowledge you as Lord over all. So be with us in our worship as we continue to give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and sing with us. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. And I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you, Lord, my shield. I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will love you, God. God, I look to you. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom, because you know just what to do. And I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you.
invited by redeeming love before the throne of God above he pulls me close with nails God hands into his everlasting Condemnation grips my heart And Satan tempts me to despair I hear the voice that scatters fear The great I am, the Lord is here Oh, praise the one who soul eternally. Only I have crushed your throne. Blameless now I'm running home. By your blood I come, welcomed as your into the arms of More beauty than this world has known I'm face to face with God himself His perfect spotless righteousness A thousand years, a thousand times Are not enough to sing His
from First Chronicles. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And from Psalm 142, I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Let's sing Your Love Defends Me. You are my joy, you are my song, you are the well, the one I'm drawing from. You are my refuge, my whole life long, where else would I go? Surely my God is the strength of my soul, your love defends. I'd like to just take some time this morning to pray. There's a lot going on probably in your lives, uh, things you've come with here today, and there's certainly a lot going on in our world, and I thought we'd just take a few moments to just go before God and uh, intercede with Him. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear God, we are so glad that your love defends us. Lord, that we can have joy and confidence knowing that you are always with us. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. Lord, and we thank you for having a roof over our heads, for having people in our lives who love us. We thank you for that just astounding beauty of your creation. Lord, and there's just so much we can be grateful for. We just, in this moment of silence, Lord, we just name whatever it is, Lord, that we are especially thankful for you for this morning.
Lord, we also know that we have contributed to the hurt and the problems in this world, perhaps even in our own homes or our workplaces. There have been times that we have not loved you with all our hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. So, Lord, in this moment of silence, we just want to name before you the things that we have done or not done that we know are not pleasing to you, that are not according to your will. And Lord, we're just so grateful that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just, and you do forgive us our sins, and you do purify us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, now we just name <clears throat> that there are things in this world, there are things in this nation that we need to be praying for. Lord, we want to pray for um, just the impact of this virus, uh, not only on our own community, our own families, our own congregation here, but Lord, also uh, just the impacts that that's having in churches and people's lives and families and nations around the world, Lord. So we pray that you would continue to uh, help us to learn and become stronger internally, that you would be with those who have lost loved ones. Lord, we pray for those who are working on uh, making and distributing vaccines. And Lord, we just pray that your hand would show itself powerfully uh, through this uh, such unusual chapter uh, in all of our lives. Lord, we also pray for our state and national leaders. Lord, we pray for extraordinary wisdom in extraordinary days. Lord, we pray that through Everything going on, Lord, that those who belong to you and believe in you would lift your name high and live in a way that you would have us to live. Lord, we pray for great wisdom and great discernment in these days. Lord, we pray for this congregation in a time of a bit of uncertainty, Lord. I pray for a deep sense of your peace, a deep confidence that you are in control, Lord, and that you we use every person here in ways that will give you glory. Lord, we pray that you will work your purposes out. Lord, you have done a mighty work in this congregation out in the countryside with extraordinary people. Lord, and you who have begun a good work will be faithful to bring that to completion. And so, Lord, I pray your great blessing and discernment upon Lake Union Church at this time. And Lord, we pray for our families. Lord, we pray for our families that we would grow in our love for each other, for others in our household. Lord, we pray for neighbors and friends and co-workers, for students we go to school with, Lord, that they would see in us individually, they would see in our families, they would see in this congregation that you are alive and that you care and that there is a way to live that's far greater than how the world lives Lord, and that we would live uh, remarkable lives, lives that people would remark on and say, what is it about these people? So, Lord, let our light shine uh, with your love and your light that others may come to know you as well. And give us the courage to step out of our comfort zones, to uh, do things maybe we haven't done before. And, Lord, may that be propelled and compelled by the love of Jesus that was within us. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. You know, this past Sunday, if you were here, uh, you recall how we closed the service with a short documentary. It was about a man in China. His name was Li Yang. And if you saw that, I don't know if you caught it, but just how this man totally lived out his faith. You know, he shared Christ with people. In his high rise, he led a house church and he discipled new believers in his apartment. And this video was, this documentary was made probably a few years back. But as difficult as it was for those believers to live out their faith in hiding back then, things have only now gotten more difficult. In fact, it was just last month in an article in the Christian Post, and it was reported that tens of and th of thousands of house church pastors and evangelists across China have gone 
into hiding as the Communist Party prepares for what they say is a final assault on Christianity in an attempt to eradicate it from the country. The missions organization Asia Harvest says that pastors now have disconnected from their phones and their computers so government authorities can no longer track their whereabouts. And these pastors have also destroyed the microchips and the ID cards that everybody in China is required to carry so authorities cannot track their location. Chinese authorities are also now uh, ordering Christians to renounce their faith. They're also demolishing churches. And they're literally rewriting the Bible. Claiming in, in one instance in John 8, where Jesus encountered the woman caught in adultery, uh, the new government-sanctioned version says that Jesus actually murdered the woman and referred to himself as a sinner, which of course is not in the Bible. Asia Harvest says that the communist regime is doing all it can to try to control the church and render it powerless and subservient to the communist system. In fact, around the world this last year, in 2020, the number of Christians killed for their faith has increased by 60%. Now, half of that is because of Nigerian Christians who have been killed by Islamic extremists. And then also in places like India, where the ruling Hindu party has turned a blind eye to attacks on Christians by Hindu extremists. Now, in the U.S., we're not China and we're not India, and we're not Nigeria, at least not yet. But I think we know that recent events here in our country show that unthinkable things can happen even here. And it doesn't really matter, I don't think, if you're coming from the political left or the political right or somewhere in between. They just don't Christians really more and more be in the crosshairs of quite a few people, whether we deserve it or we don't deserve it. And then you just add to that the explosion of surveillance technology and the unrest we all know about and the power of big global corporations and tech companies and the media. And I suspect that Christians could be just as vulnerable to persecution here as any time in U.S. history. In Rochester, for example, where we live and where my wife Judy teaches in the public schools, there's just a kind of a whole new generation of teachers and now some new school board members who uh, have an agenda that's very much in opposition with Christian values. And Judy's kind of facing more and more subtle pressure to go along with things that contradict her faith. And she has to really weigh the consequences of what she says and what she does. So today's Bible passage from the uh, sec second half of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2, and then we're going to go into the first part of chapter 3, it's probably as relevant to us today as it was to those first century believers. So if you will, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians. We'll start in chapter 2, starting with verse 13, and we're going to go all the way through chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 8, but let's just start with verse 13. What I'd like you to do, actually, is take a look at, your, a look at the screen or your Bibles, if you have the same version, the New Living. Um, but let's just read this verse together, out loud. Therefore, we never stop thanking God that when you received his message from us, you didn't think of the words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which of course it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. What I, lo I love it. What we see right away in verse 13 is once again how specific and generous Paul is in affirming these believers. You know, he reminds them how they accepted the apostles' message as more than mere words. Instead, they recognized that these were words accompanied by the, the presence and the power of Jesus Christ himself. Paul says, continues to work in whoever believes in him. And he's saying this to really strengthen their identity as God's children and to strengthen their resolve to keep going in spite of the opposition that they were facing. 
And this persecution they were facing had come in part because these new Christians had rejected the politics of the Roman Empire. They had declared Jesus as Lord rather than Caesar. And while this had brought severe suffering, Paul says, at the hands of their own countrymen, well, God, God was powering their witness and giving them the strength to endure and even to thrive. But how was that? Let's look on at verses 14 through 16. Paul says, And then, dear brothers and sisters, you suffered persecution from your own countrymen. In this way, you imitated the believers in God's churches in Judea, who, because of their belief in Christ Jesus, suffered from their own people, the Jews. For some of the Jews killed the prophets, and some even killed the Lord Jesus. Now they persecuted us too. They fail to please God and work against all humanity as they try to keep us from preaching the good news of salvation to the Gentiles. <clears throat> By doing this, they continue to pile up their sins. <clears throat> but the anger of God is caught up with them at last. And really kind of what's happening here is Paul is going off on a bit of a tangent uh, about how Jews are persecuting the Judean church. But, but the core of really what he's trying to get at here is that these Thessalonians are not alone in their suffering. That other believers and other congregations had suffered too. And because Paul had personally experienced suffering and persecution, I think that's why Paul was so concerned with how his spiritual kids in Thessalonica were doing. Well, we see this in verses 17 and 18. <clears throat> He says, Dear brothers and sisters, after we were separated from you for a little while, the hearts never left you. We tried very hard to come back because of our intense longing to see you again. We wanted very much to come to you, and, and I, Paul, tried again and again, but Satan prevented us. Do you just get some of the sense of Paul's concern for them as their spiritual parent? You know, last week we watched our sweet granddaughter for a few hours on Friday, and then she came, came back over again on Saturday, and I warned you that I was going to show you a picture, so I won't do it too often, but that's, I warned you. But three days later, it's just three days later, I told Judy, boy, I miss that little peanut. So I just kind of snuck over to her house the next day to just, just play with her for just a little bit. And maybe you felt the same way about your own kids or a grandkids, say if maybe they've been away at camp for a few days. Or kids, when you've been away at camp and then you start to get a little homesick. Or maybe when you drop off your kid at college for the first time, then you look longingly at their empty bedroom or their empty place at the dinner table. So you can kind of understand Paul's sense of longing for these guys. Uh, their separation was not something that he would have chosen. And you sense how concerned Paul was for how they were doing. And we're going to see this more in detail in the weeks ahead. In verse 17, as we saw, he said that they, were made, they made these repeated attempts to get back to Thessalonica to see the church there. And maybe there were legal barriers that kept them from visiting, or maybe they kept getting sick. We don't really know what it was, but Paul attributes it as a tax from Satan. But you get the sense that Paul wanted to see them so badly because, well, for him, they, they represented the, the fruit and the evidence of the ministry that God had given him. And if they've been steadfast in their loyalty, if they've been faithful to Christ, well, then that means that his own life had counted for something. I hope we all feel that way about people that we are shepherding and discipling into maturity. I hope we love the people we're discipling so much that we can't wait to see them. Maybe that we sometimes lay awake at night concerned for how they're doing in the faith. Because one day, the, you, the way that you and I are going to be evaluated by God is by the fruit that we have produced in the lives of others. Look again at verses 19 and 20 and just notice how Paul affirms them. And let's read this passage together as well out loud. After all, what gives us hope and joy 
And what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns? It is you. Yes, you are our pride and joy. Is that a great passage? Notice how Paul calls his crown. It's this picture of the laurel wreath that ancient athletes used to wear when they won a competition. It's a lot like an Olympic gold medal. Paul says, you're like my gold medal. You notice how Paul, uh, some versions say he glories or he boasts in what Christ had been accomplishing through them. It's that deep, deep joy that a parent has when their kids have done well, and especially in those things that matter most to God. And I want you to notice, too, how Paul's joy here is so relational. He's feeling what you and I feel when we know that we are the sparkle in someone else's eyes. When someone lets us know, and they really mean it, I am so glad to be with you. And it's the same joy that Jesus has when he's around us. Because his eyes sparkle and his face shines whenever he sees us and is with us. It kind of reminds me of my high school and college days, and I was in uh, public schools when I met new friends who loved Jesus too, or we'd say, oh, I'm a Christian too. You know, and this joy we experienced whenever we talked about Jesus or studied the Bible together or prayed for each other, or for friends we knew that we wanted to come to not come and know and find Jesus. It's the same joy we experienced when we happened to have lunch together or went on Sundays to church together. Or when our faces lit up when we, we went to those before school Bible studies and people were just so glad to be with us. What's well, that kind of joy that Paul had for the Thessalonians? And you know, our brains and our hearts run best on this kind of joy as well. It's what the ancient blessing in the book of Numbers captures when we sometimes say on a Sunday morning, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. We see this joy in other places in the Bible as well. Take, for instance, uh, Psalm 1611. And this often gets lost in translation. The NIV says, in your presence is fullness of joy. But the Hebrew actually says, there is abundance of joy in your face, or with your face. Because you see, God designed us to rejoice in faces. In fact, there's a direct link between our facial recognition circuitry in our brain and our brain's joy center. Do you know you have a joy center in your brain? I'll go, I'll go into that some other time. It's right behind your right front eyes, in the front part of your brain. So this explains Paul's urgency to get back and see face to face these believers that he loved so much. He knew what we now know, that when we see each other face to face and we communicate that we are glad to be with each other, that's when our emotional gas tanks get filled. I want you to do something right now. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, I am so glad to be with you. Look him in the eye. Now turn around to somebody in another row who's not in your family and say the same thing. Turn around and say, I'm so glad to be with you. And, and it's so hard with masks. I mean, I, and I'm not, I'm not an anti-mask person, but it's just, it's what's made this season hard for a lot of us, is that, so we just have to communicate a lot with our eyes, you know. Uh, but God has wired us for this connection. And when we practice this, it strengthens our capacity to experience even more joy. All the while, it's building our maturity and our resilience. But the face, the face is key. Maybe I'll talk another time about when our relational circuits are on, 
we tend to look at people. When we're being non-relational, when those circuits are off, we tend to look away. Isn't that true? The face is key. So how can believers survive and even thrive through hope-challenged times, even if that includes persecution? And what can we learn from the steadfastness and the resilience of the Thessalonians as they faced opposition and suffering? Let's wrap up with chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Paul says, Finally, dear brother, uh, finally, when we could stand it no longer, we decided to stay alone in Athens, and we sent Timothy to visit you. He is our brother and God's co worker in proclaiming the good news of Christ. We sent him to strengthen you, to encourage you in your faith, and to keep you from being shaken by the troubles you were going through. But you know that we are destined for such troubles. Even while we were with you, we warned you that troubles would soon come, and they did, as you well know. That is why, when I could bear it no longer, I sent Timothy to find out whether your faith was still strong. I was afraid that the tempter had gotten the best of you, and that our work had been useless. But now, but now, Timothy has just returned, bringing us good news about your faith and love. He reports that you always remember our visit with joy and that you want to see us as much as we want to see you. So we have been greatly encouraged in the midst of our troubles and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, because you have remained strong in the faith. It gives us, I love this, it gives us new life to know that you are standing firm in the Lord. And I believe that it was the joy that these Thessalonian believers experienced in their relationship with the Lord and in their relationship with mentors like Paul, Silas, and Timothy and the joy they were experiencing with each other that gave them the fuel to survive and thrive in the middle of all the hard times that they were going through. You see, joy is more than an emotion they're coming to understand now that joy is actually, you could say it's a super emotion that can go on top of and connect with other emotions. Michael Hendricks, in a very <clears throat> fascinating book on this subject that just came out, says, for example, if I lose my job, this is usually not considered a joyful emotion. Instead, I'm probably feeling some combination of sadness, fear, and anger. However, when I experience these unpleasant emotions and can simultaneously feel that God is with me, I have added joy into the mix. If I have close friends who are with me in my loss, my joy magnifies even more. Now I'm feeling sad and joyful, fearful and joyful, angry and joyful. Joy does not replace the unpleasant emotions, he says. Instead, it combines with my emotions to keep me relationally connected in distress. It's pretty powerful stuff. You've got to kind of think about that for a minute. We'll come back to that in just a second. One of the questions we ask now is, if we have this kind of resilient joy... How do we respond when people oppose us in hope-challenged times? Well, because of the positive report that Timothy came back with, we can sure that the Thessalonians were learning to respond much the same way that Paul will instruct them later on in chapter 5 when he says, See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. You see, Paul, and of course Jesus before him, could not be more clear that doing good and not retaliation is the proper response to persecution. As Jesus said in Luke 6, he says, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. And Paul said a lot of the same thing in Romans 12 when he says, Bless those who persecute you. 
Bless and do not curse. In fact, not once in Paul's letters does Paul instruct believers to hate their persecutors or react violently against them. A believer's task is always to love our enemies and leave vengeance to God himself. You see, violence against our enemies or in response to persecution, it's never the way of the gospel. So as believers, we don't take our cues from the world around us, but from God in his word. And we take our cues from Jesus Christ himself, who gave his life for us on the cross, even while we were still his enemies. And the joy that we receive in our relationship with God and with other believers then allows us to suffer well with joy in community. As Michael Hendricks goes on to remind us, he says that when we have the gift of each other and the Holy Spirit, because we have that, it's a sign that we were not meant to suffer alone. So we lean on God and we lean on other believers when times get tough. It's kind of like when a family or a congregation comes together, when someone they love dies. Because when we gather around that open casket during the review or at the side of a grave at the cemetery or when we come back and gather around piles of ham and scalped potatoes and chocolate cake at the lunch afterwards, as we eat together and share in our stories and in our sadness, we find joy because we are glad to be together. So I encourage you to remember this when troubles and suffering come your way. Remember Jesus who for the joy set before him endured the cross and disregarded its shame. Remember Jesus whose face lights up whenever he is with you. Remember Paul and Silas and Timothy and their love for these Thessalonians. And remember the example of these believers who through the joy that they were experienced remained strong in the faith and kept standing firm in the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, this passage at least reminds me that I need you so much and I need your love and your joy to flow through me all of the fruit of the Spirit to be able to be Jesus to others, to let them know with my eyes and my face and my words and my tone of voice that I am glad to be with them. And Lord, maybe there are just some of us here today who just have neglected that and who need to say, Lord, I just need to reorient myself again to you. Lord, I need your spirit to come and make me new so that people can see in me the presence and the love and the joy of Jesus. Lord, I pray blessings upon this congregation, Lord, as they have been faithful and strong and resilient and have shined your light in this community that would continue and deepen and strengthen as you bind them together in bonds of love, even with masks, even with distancing, Lord, that you can work past that supernaturally, Lord, that uh, your light would shine brightly through this place. So we once again offer ourselves to you, commit ourselves to you, Lord, and use us for the strengthening of others, for the joy of others, for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close today, let's stand as I give you this ancient blessing. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, his face upon you, and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go enjoy. Serve the Lord.